Hi guys, I'm Kat Sasso and I'm here with Kate Jakowitz for Female Football Week. Kate has had one of the most illustrious careers in Australian football, so let's talk to her a bit about it. Where did your love of football start? Where did it all begin? I often have to like reflect on that and, and try to try to think where, where actually it did, like where did the, the seed get planted? Um, but I think it was uh, my two best friends, childhood friends, uh, George and Thomas, and they started playing football and well, I thought everything that, well, I wanted to do everything they did. So um, I, I guess I asked my mum that I wanted to play and uh, it, it just went from there. Yeah, and then obviously you've had this amazing refereeing career, but where did that, where did the passion for that start? Well, I don't know if it was so much passion to begin with. It was more uh, maybe entrepreneurship uh, a little bit, the, the prospect of just collecting pocket money every weekend. Um, I, I think the story goes that I, I refereed my brother's match who, where the referee never turned up and I just really enjoyed, I guess, being in the middle, being in control of, you know, however many players it was and having to make decisions really quickly. Like, I don't know, that just really appealed to like, me as a, I guess, 12 or 13 year old at that point in time. And obviously I was a, um, I just, I loved playing at that point in time. Um, it was just already so deeply ingrained in me as a, I guess, as a, as that 12 year old and I just couldn't get enough and I get, that's when it, it, it grew that that passion started to grow uh, the the challenge of each match um, was different to that of playing um, I'm, I'm really just trying to reflect as myself as a as that 12 year old person and what was it that drew me to to refereeing or the skills that refereeing provided um, and I, I know it was like the decision making uh, I guess also helping the young players through like you know I always remember like having to show them the throw and the prop the correct proper throw in technique um, that just really appealed to me and like I said it, it grew uh, all the way like I you know started at 13 and obviously now I'm 38 so that spans is that 25 years fantastic career though what was it like to be a young woman in that space obviously back you know it's a lot more common now but I feel like back when you were growing up it might not have been and you might not have seen as many women in that place so what was it like for you as a young woman woman in that in that environment I was really fortunate um, when I started playing that I was also wanted to play in in the boys team. like the boys wanted me to play in their team also the boys parents wanted me to play in their team because I was a top goal scorer so like oh we want we want Kate in our team um so I I again I and I started refereeing at my junior football club as well so I feel like because I was able to grow within a really welcoming and safe environment of my my junior football club um that it it enabled me to feel comfortable uh, learning the skills as a young referee and I and I also have to credit um, the football club. We had a referee coordinator who was uh, a local school teacher as well. Her name was Jill Forder. And she was a woman, uh, had sons who refereed and played football in the club as well. And, but she just really provided that uh, security and safety within the club for the young referees to, basically we were learning and like we were kids, we're, go we're learning. Um, and she provided that protection for us. So as a female, it didn't really, um, it wasn't really highlighted to me that I was a, a female in an, like an all boys or all male environment because it was just so inclusive and it was a place that I was familiar with and felt safe and comfortable in. Um, and because I guess I had, uh, I was well known around the club as well um, because my mum was heavily involved in the club. So that, like I said, my, my journey was really for, like, fortunate and, uh, you know, I think that allowed me to um, learn and, and I guess, yeah, feel safe. And it, it really enhanced my, uh, 
my passion and, and love for it rather than going the opposite way and having a negative effect or having a negative impact, which 100% that is a, a lived experience for a lot of young, not only just young referees, but specifically young female referees as well to this day right now. So I think it really highlights the, the need for um, like clubs to, to uh, I guess, provide that um, for, for our, our, young, our young referees and even our young players. Like we have to remember we're kids or they, they are kids and kids learn, kids need to learn and they need to feel safe when they're learning. So uh, yeah, I know that was a really long winded story, um, but that's, yeah, that was my experience. Yeah, totally. And before we get into obviously all the things that you've achieved so far in your career, do you think that having that foundation to grow into and to start your career in, do you think that that's the reasoning why you've done as well as you have in your career? Do you think that that foundation has kind of, it put you in a good place to continue on? Absolutely. I, I credit um, how I started my journey um, to, to my success like later on. And it, it allowed me to develop those skills naturally and and not feel like it was like a hostile or like a hostile environment um don't get me wrong like i did have experiences where i had to uh like uncomfortable experiences with with male coaches or um you know aggressive parents or like i still had those experiences but with um you know being able to do it in my club i had support who would come with me and help me navigate those challenging situations rather than feeling like I was by myself or alone and I had to do it all by myself and that's a really lonely and isolating feeling especially for a kid um, but I had like I said Jill would I would tell the story um, there was this coach from a rival club um, he was very big muscly like overbearing overpowering man and he didn't agree with some of my decisions and I think his team lost, like I don't know the finer details, but instead of allowing that situation to maybe uh, snowball into something that maybe I would internalize and become like fearful of, Jill took me to con not confront the man, but to talk it out with the coach and just say, Hey, look, she's 13 years old. And you know, if you want to ask her questions about, you know, what did she think of this decision and, and that decision, but also she did it in a way where it wasn't confrontational, but it was all, it was like a, um, a, facilitated a conversation that was productive and it was a learning opportunity for me. It was a learning opportunity for him, like an adult and a child engaging in a learning opportunity that wasn't hostile, that wasn't, uh, yeah, like just at each other. And for me, that showed me the power of, I get not negotiation, but like just confronting a, a really challenging situation with composure and just keeping it factual in, in a way. And that like, I, I was so young then and to have that sort of experience and an adult guiding me uh, allowed me then to think of ways to do that and, and basically like, grow from that and expand on that. And that's where I've kind of got to now. And that's added to my skill set as a, as a referee or like professional referee or elite referee where I am now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, absolutely that young experience or experience that I had as a young referee has, uh, I guess, shaped me into the referee that, that I was able to become today. Absolutely. And... You obviously said before you've had a 25 year ish long career. Where, what was your big break? Do you think? What was, where was, what was the moment where, where the, the pebble dropped? Um, I remember I was refereeing at my local club still, and but it was finals weekend. So our club just happened to be hosting that. And we had a representative from the Federation who would go around to the grounds and, and watch the young referees. Um, and he, he saw me uh, and he came up and had a chat and I wish for the life of me I remembered his name because he then put in a call to the Queen, oh, I'm from Queensland, so I started refereeing there. 
And he put in a call to the state coach, which is the equivalent of Tony here in Victoria. And then I was invited to, like maybe a month or two later, I was invited to the state titles, which was being held on the Gold Coast. So I was a late admission because they're like, you have to see this girl. I think I was only 17 at the time. So I'd only been refereeing for four years. And that's where they saw me and they said, look, you're raw and green, but you have something. You, you have that, because I was a player as well. They could see that I understood football very, very early at a, as a 17 year old. I didn't get selected for nationals from there, but then the next year I got invited back to the state titles and then I got the final and then was invited to the national titles. So I always pinpoint my big break to being that moment in time where I was seen, I was uh, put on the representative pathway and then that's basically where I started and I didn't stop from there. Um, I guess then my second big break would have to be the inclusion of or the inception of um, the A-League women's back then it was called the W League when they created that league and I would basically finished my nationals pathway and I was in limbo because we had no national league for women and then the, the FA or Football Australia sorry created the W League and I was put onto that and again like I said I haven't stopped from there so two two big breaks in my career and I'm very fortunate that uh I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. So you've obviously been with the, what's now the W League, but you've been with them since 2008. What is, what's been the evolution? Like what have you noticed year on, year on out that it, that's changed with the game? Yeah, well, uh, back when the W League started, it was only a 14 round competition. And this year is the first full length season I think of the full home and away season so that's just one notable change um, in the beginning I don't know maybe the first five years we, we didn't have a lot of international imports and then imports started coming in because it was it, it was the opposite to their season and so they would come in in their off season and that's when we started to get uh, like internationally recognized so that would be another change um, and what I see now, like after having maybe a couple, I haven't been on the league the last few years, like consistently because of international, um, I guess, appointments, uh, has been the, I guess, influx or growth of junior players coming into the, into the game. And it, it, I don't want to label it a development league, but it's just giving that additional pathway and that extra edge for younger players to get into the a semi-professional league and experience or get a taste of that professional environment in, in elite sport and in elite football. And, the, and then it then um, is their stepping stone into getting uh, selected into um, European clubs. The progression for referees is, is no different. Um, we've had a pretty solid referee panel on the A-League women's for, for quite some time. But now we're starting to see, with the introduction of the, the Referee Academy, um, some, some debuts, uh, which is amazing to see that we're, we're blooding new blood and, and they're getting a taste of that, that next level of football. Um, so yeah, the, the W League or the A League Women's provides uh, uh, an incredible opportunity for, for, I guess, our next gen. And, and hopefully it's just that pathway to to the, to the next stage, um, yeah. Absolutely, and what was it like getting your first call up for the A-League men's? Yeah, uh, A-League men's, uh, I can't say that it was ever a dream of mine. I, I remember my earliest dream um, as a young player and I would always say to my grandpa, I wanna play for Manchester United. And like at that point in time, there was no women's team for Manchester United. Um, but now there is like, how amazing is that within 25 years? You know, now there's a, a women's football team for Manchester United. Um, so therefore I, I never really, but when, when I got into refereeing, I never really thought the men's pathway was, it, I don't want to say it wasn't an achievable dream because it's, it certainly was, but it just wasn't on my radar. Like I was, I was loving women's football. I had obviously done men's football back in community, um, 
but yeah, A League men's. I was just like, it, if it, if it, if the opportunity presents itself, yeah, I'd go for it. Um, but it wasn't something that I was I, I had my heart set on. Um, but then you know the, I guess the the landscape started to to change in refereeing. And opportunities then started to be created f for. I'm not going to say like a genderless panel, but really refereeing has really not a lot to do with gender. It's where we're elite decision makers and we are elite people managers or player managers, for example, but at the end of the day, they're still people and, and, and we're event managers. And we just have, we just have to have enough athletic ability to get us around the park to, to see it. We're not elite athletes. So therefore it comes back to like, what does gender have to do with it? And really there's nothing. And it's just about the skills that you develop as a, as a referee, as a match official and understanding football and understanding the, the players that involved in the game and, and what's required of your, your roles and responsibilities. So to get the call up at the time, obviously it, it was, it was a, a big deal because it was um, it's first like in history in Australia. But I don't think I really understood the impact it would have until later. And I think I said that at the time. Um, so yeah, I think back then I really hadn't given it a lot of thought, but now looking back and seeing the way that the world has changed and embraced this change. Now we've got women refereeing at the men's world cup we're going to have, we have women refereeing at the Asian Cup. Um, we have women refereeing in the, the Champions League in, in Europe. Like everywhere in the world, we're now seeing women just become more involved in, in the game. And for my little piece of history, it was just, it's just a part of a, such a, a bigger movement um, in history, in world football. And it's, it's one that I hope to see continue and just become a norm. 100%. Do you have anything, is there anything specific from your career that sticks out to you? Like what for you has been your greatest achievement, do you think, in terms of the tournaments that you've been called up to or anything like that? What do you think for yourself has been your greatest achievement so far? Um, I would have to say it's a, it's a pretty personal one. And I mean, it starts with Australia and New Zealand. 2023 like and getting winning the bid for the, the women's world cup and i was uh experiencing well, not experiencing I, I had recently come into a, a diagnosis of um, a form of arthritis and the, it was touch and go whether i would make it to australia new zealand and obviously, like we, uh, home World Cup is something that is just once in a lifetime. So once I was a candidate for 2023, uh, essentially, what maybe other people's journey on the on the candidates program would be, is that you, you're building up to 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 the to the World Cup and and trying to get selection. But for me, it was again trying to understand. What, uh, what I could do, like what I was capable of within this diagnosis and would I be able to handle getting to a World Cup? Um, and even right up till, until three weeks out, I got another small injury. So three weeks out from the World Cup, I, I had a tear in my calf, almost, almost did a semi cur. And that final three weeks before the World Cup was the most stressful three weeks of my life. Um, FIFA was so supportive and they just, they were with me every step of the way. Like we were talking every day on the phone. They were in Zurich or Switzerland and I was here and we were like all hours of the day, phone calls. And, but they wanted me there and I had to, I didn't know, I didn't know I would make it. And I didn't know if I'd get on the park. Um, so then the first two weeks of our preparatory course in the World Cup, again, I didn't know if I'd make it. Every day was like a, is it gonna come back? Am I gonna re-tear my calf? 
but I just, every day they just kept pushing me and pushing me, seeing how far I could go until the final, um, we have a, a mini tournament before the World Cup starts and called the Referee Cup. So it was a group of like teams of, from Sydney, local Sydney teams, under 21s or something. And we all had to referee half a match. But FIFA appointed me to a full match to see if I could get through 90 minutes. And uh, the big bosses, the big FIFA bosses were there as well to, to watch the game. And I knew what it meant. The rest of the girls knew what it meant. Could I get through this 90 minutes? And would that, which would then enable me to, to whistle a match at the, at, to, at the World Cup. After the first 45, um, Carrie comes down and says, we're happy. You don't have to do the rest of the match. And I turned to her and I said, I'm going to do the 90 to prove to myself that I can do 90 minutes. And she goes, we knew you'd say that. And then they allowed me to, to, to referee. That was the most, like, at the time, like, you try to handle your emotions, right? But that was the most emotional, like, three or four weeks of my life in my, in my career, I would say. Then we sat around waiting for an actual appointment. Uh, and then the first appointment came, it was France, Brazil. So I've gone from refereeing under 21 Sydney MPL uh, boys to then France, Brazil, two top 10 teams in the world meeting in the, in the group stage. And like, yeah. I can't, I can't describe to you the emotions and then also then having to switch on and be like, I've got a job to do um, in your first home World Cup match and in front of 50,000 people at Suncorp Stadium um, and then to walk off that match and nail it. I, I went and saw my parents afterwards and mum just saying, you can't stop smiling. I'm like, because what I went through was, I just couldn't wipe the smile off my face because we'd made it. And every single, and myself and my two assistants, Kyo Min and, and Joanna, they'd each had a, a, a personal journey as well to get to that, that match as well. And we all had this like shared moment and shared experience of like, we all didn't think we'd make it to this point and we did. And the change room afterwards was just like, I don't know, an emotional mess, but it was, it was happy tears. Um, so, to answer your question, that is the most, I get, that's the, my, my biggest achievement in my career was getting through that preparation um, with the changes to my body and trying to understand the changes that I was experiencing and still to come out and referee like, referee better than I'd ever have. That is crazy. That's insane. Oh my God, I'm like, <laughs> that is crazy. Honestly, to be able to referee a World Cup at home, like in Australia, would have been such an awesome experience for you. So to be able to say that that's your greatest achievement and that's what you did and, you know, you got yourself ready in time for that, absolutely 100% that would have to be, you know, one of the biggest achievements ever. But looking forward now, what's next for you? Uh, what's next? So I retired on field from FIFA uh, at the end of 2023. Uh, but my, I guess, next goal or next part of my journey in, in refereeing is as a video match official. So I've retained my video match official FIFA accreditation. And right now, currently, uh, I am working my way towards I'm on, I'm on the pathway to, let's say, the 26 Men's World Cup. So hopefully I'm getting enough experience, getting enough big match minutes and experience um, to get selected for that. Again, that's, a, that's the big dream. But right now what I'm enjoying is just is, is, uh, learning a new, uh, I guess, skill and aspect to refereeing. Um, I'm a different part of the team now. I had a different value. Uh, I've already been to the, the under-17 Men's World Cup as a VAR. I've been now on the Asian Champions League as a VAR. Obviously, I'm on the, the Men's A-League. And uh, just as of, you know, 
day ago, I've been selected for the Olympics as a VMO. So as we, as we go along, um, yeah, it's, it's just piecing together that journey and, and hopefully working towards the, the big holy grail. Um, if, I, if I make it, amazing. Uh, if I don't, I've now experienced another, another part, another aspect of, of refereeing and being a part of the world game in a, in, a, in a different way off the field. And my final question for you is, do you have any advice for young women who might be watching this and considering a career in refereeing? Do you have any advice for them? And do you also have any advice for maybe the football clubs that are kind of supporting them and the people around them? Mm. Number one, you belong. You belong on the field. And anyone telling you otherwise or maybe suggesting that you need to get back in the kitchen, just they, they just, they don't understand. Don't let them take away your power. You hold the power and you are the one who decides where you get to be. But I guess something that I've always, when I felt like alone or I've wanted to walk away, it's, it's always been, it always comes back to my purpose and what I'm doing it for. And I always come back to, I love football. I love being a part of it. Uh, I love the challenge, even though when sometimes those challenges seem so daunting or so uncomfortable that it doesn't make you feel good. When you work your way through those challenges and when you haven't, when you are, I guess, not achieve success, but like when you are faced with a challenge and then you can overcome it or you can problem solve your way around it, or you can make the right decisions or it's about like feeling that accomplishment because you've been met with, met with a challenge and you've, and you've worked your way through it. It may not have been pretty or it may not have been exactly the way you'd wanted to do it, but you've still got to come to the other side and you've, you've, you worked your way through it. You found a way and that's just going to add to I guess your skill set and your tools for the next time you're faced with a similar problem or maybe another problem and you work your way through it um, so I guess my my uh, what I'm trying to say there and my point there is like we may not like the way we do it when we originally do it but we We still find a way to, to, to get to the other side, if that makes sense. I'm not really articulating this quite well. But like, I know those moments when you're feeling alone and, and sad and, and you want to walk away. Um, but like, for me, it's just about remaining flexible and, and understanding that, or right, I may not have done it right the, the way I wanted to do it this time, but you reflect on that and then you, you find a way to, to do it the way you want it the next time. So yeah, it's just about staying flexible and having your purpose and um, always finding like your why or like that enjoyment in, in that why. Um, so yeah, don't, and don't be afraid to be yourself. Yeah. Um, the clubs, advice to the clubs. It's just really simple, really. Their kids, their kids, and kids like allow kids the freedom and safety to learn and and explore, um, and yeah, to be themselves, because that's that's how they're going to feel comfortable to 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 want to learn more, um, and because once they they stop learning, I think as adults or as as, as people, we 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 failed if they if they don't want to if they want to walk away from that because it's too hard or too uncomfortable or too scary. Like we want to keep them um, uh, uh, curious and inquisitive and, and engaged. And I think as, as people who are s like, who service the game, that's, that's our main role and responsibility uh, to the kids um, in, in the game. And that's, that's the role that we play in the game. So, yeah. Thank you so much for sitting down to chat today. Obviously, I think a lot of people wouldn't really know some of the
deeper things about your story and about how you've come so far and how you've achieved everything that you have. So I think it's really important, especially, you know, it's Female Football Week. It's really important that we're not only focusing on the athletes because there's so much more that goes into football. There's so many more roles and there's so many more places for women. So thank you so much for sitting down today and telling me your story. Thank you. Thank you for having me.